this week we return to a more basic concept in sociology, a uh, much more overarching concept that is something that is very key to many of the different subjects that we cover during the semester, and that subject is culture. Now this, this uh, lecture, this week's lecture, will be separated into two parts. And so the first part, we're just going to go over some of the basic ideas about culture, what it is, and what are some of the elements of culture. And in the second part, we're going to look at, uh, more specifically, a couple of components of culture, and that is norms and values. So this chapter really looks at a uh, definition of culture and what are some of the components of what we call symbolic culture. Um, and also takes a look at uh, smaller cultures within a culture. And one is called a subculture um, and we'll talk about what that is and the difference between that and countercultures which is the other smaller culture within a larger culture. We will talk about norms and values in society in the second part and also look at technology uh, and how it's impacting culture in what the author likes to refer to as the global village and also some uh, components of or some explanations of how it is that culture spreads around the world uh, through cultural lag diffusion and labeling. To begin with, a basic definition of culture is that it is the language, beliefs, values, norms, and behaviors of a group that are passed on from one generation to the next. Now there is a key element of this, what makes a culture, and that is that a culture survives its members. Um, by uh, utilizing many of the institutions in our society, for instance, that is the I institution of religion and the institution of education, the legal institution, and uh, on and on, um, we teach the young our beliefs, our values, the behaviors we expect of them. We teach them our language all of those kinds of elements of our of our culture so that when we pass on our children continue the tradition the language the values the norms the beliefs that we gave to them uh, in the younger years and so that is how culture is passed along um, it is also passed along through other forms of uh, um, of institutions in our society today for instance with the media there is an awful lot of uh, cultural messages that are passed on to the youth and to the older people for that matter uh, in any one culture now it's interesting that as for instance as a parent what you see um, the cultural value you see passed to your students or to your children rather uh, may not be the cultural values that you want passed on but that doesn't necessarily mean that those values are not being imprinted in the minds of your children and this is why many parents worry about what is on the television and how much time children spend on the television likewise the educational institution Oftentimes uh, the teachers and uh, the courses in the educational institution may not be the kinds of things that a parent wants their children taught, particularly when it comes to values. And so this is one reason why many times parents will choose to homeschool children. And so this, but this is the essence of what a culture is, is the language, beliefs, values, norms, and behaviors. Now there are also other elements of culture that include material culture. And these are the things that, um, uh, for instance, in our, in our society, you know, that we have a, a tendency to, like, home ownership is one of those things that's a big part of our culture. And, and automobiles is another part of our culture that, whereas in other parts of the world, one's method of transportation may be much more basic and really is not at all of, of any importance. And so there are material and non-material culture. Uh, aspects. So the, the uh, definition really talks more about the non-material aspects of culture. Um, sometimes the non-material culture lags behind the material culture. That is, uh, values and norms may change and lag behind uh, the advances that we make in, in material culture or whatever. And, and this is referred to as cultural lag. A term that is uh, what, that is very useful, and it's one that I used to like to tell my students in my face-to-face -face classes. This is one of these words that you get for paying for your tuition for this course. Uh, that is ethnocentrism, and if you if you break that that word down into its its parts, you know you can understand pretty much what the meaning of this word is. Ethno, your your ethnic background or an ethnic um, group, centrism being centered or figured that this. Uh, 
this is the most important thing. So ethnocentrism really is the belief that your culture is the center and the most important culture in the world. Uh, not something that is probably unusual to any American because as a group you know we really do see ourselves as the as the centerpiece of the globe one example of that is take a look at any map that you see of the world uh, in the United States particularly a, f a flat map of course um, and in the center is is the Western Hemisphere and in really if we could get away with it if it would make sense um, as far as the map itself is concerned, we would probably put the United States in the dead center of the of the map, you know, but we just haven't figured out how to do that and make it make sense. Uh, but uh, that we are in the center of the map, and, and so the east and the west are kind of, uh, you know, judged away, uh, you know, in re relation to us. So uh, it, it, that's just one little example of ethnocentrism. You know, we have ethnocentric thinking in regards to um, other cultures as well and what happens with uh, ethnocentrism is is that we begin to believe that our culture is not only well it's it's the standard by which we measure every other culture and so we begin to see it as the best and variations from that um, cultural norm are considered to be less um, less good that you know that they're just not as good as as our culture and so that's an ethnocentric thinking the alternative to that um, that I believe the authors talk about are is is cultural relativism and and we will touch on this in a few moments but but with an ethnocentric way of, of uh, thinking we think that our ways are normal natural and and um, sort of the rule of the universe when we come into culture, into contact rather with a culture that is different from what we know, oftentimes we we do experience what's known as culture shock. And and actually, having hosted some foreign exchange students, you know, they talk about culture shock in a way that actually it, it, it can have some very serious psychological and and, and physical problems, uh, physical results sometimes. Um, but typically speaking. Uh, I, I think we don't think of culture shock as being that severe. An example that's in the textbook that uh, um, maybe something that more of us can relate to than, than foreign travel is the difference between living in a village or a small community and moving to a city and, and the shock uh, that has to be absorbed by moving from this say this very little city this very little community into a large city with traffic lights and you know eight lane streets and huge malls and gigantic high schools and, and uh, tall buildings and those types of things when you when you're used to living in a in a small community where the the tallest building may be two stories and and uh, there probably isn't even that many vehicles perhaps um, and so moving from and and likewise moving from the city to the village can also have its own form of shock and so this is just an example of a map of, of urban and rural makeup in the United States um, and it's interesting you know that that uh, when you look at this map and this again is another example of what happens with statistics sometimes this makes Alaska although we are so rural and, and when you look at it geographically speaking because of the fact that over half of the individuals in the state live in Anchorage alone um, we look like an average state where where from two-thirds to three-quarters of our population lives in rural, rural settings well that may be true but that's quite a bit different from uh, the population say in Pennsylvania or uh, Oregon or Michigan for instance so um, nonetheless um, you, you I, I think probably that the the concept of cultural shock really we don't need other states to help us understand that uh, sometimes just moving in Alaska moving between villages and cities uh, is certainly a clear demonstration of that likewise cultural shock involves moving from one culture to another and uh, they the author talks about the Hmong culture um, the uh, individuals who have moved from the mountains of Laos to the United States and have uh, in large part moved to urban settings around the United States and so the author asks you to give some time to think about how disorienting it might be and what might be the most disorienting um, features to a move from uh, rather well a move from Laos to the United States or the opposite if you as, as a, an American student were moved from the United States to the mountains of Laos and so um, cultural shock can take on many different kind of definitions and implications when you consider it that way. I mentioned cultural relativism as as the uh, 
more or less opposite of ethnocentrism and with cultural relativistic view instead of seeing your culture as the yardstick or the measuring uh, ruler for the remainder of the world and other cultures um, we we judge it with cultural relativism we judge another culture's practice from its own perspective in other words we don't we don't compare it to our own and think well based on our values this is a barbaric culture but rather we try to understand the culture more or less from within itself bullfighting in Spain is an example of that where um, by and large, you know, Western individuals, uh, the sensibilities of the Americans uh, see the bullfighting as, as rather barbaric, you know, in that uh, the fight ends with the bull being slaughtered generally. And, um, and, and so we don't understand that from our culture. And yet uh, from within the Spanish culture and, and its traditions, the explanation may be much more clear. Likewise, you read about India's uh, sacred cow, I believe, last uh, a f week or two ago. And this is another example of this where in India, you know, cows are, are not edible. They're not there to eat and uh, oftentimes may roam the street and, and they're more or less uh, uh, revered, I suppose. And uh, this is really based upon um, rather ancient uh, uh, practices and traditions in, in India that uh, relate to how important the, the cow was to the to the functioning of that society many many years ago and while while those um, those features may no longer be true that may not be the case any longer nonetheless the cow continues to have its very revered status in the discussion boards around this topic of the sacred cow you know oftentimes we find um, uh, students uh, falling back on technology is the answer for America's sacred cow and um, I, I think that really kind of misses the point of what the sacred cow is about about because um, this implies a sort of an, an anachronistic uh, connection and, and uh, belief about a, a particular thing like for instance that the cow is sacred and we don't touch it but there's really not a rational kind of thing in India that would explain that any longer um, uh, to me, more of a, an example of sacred cows might be the family pet, for instance, where not only do we not eat a dog or a cat, uh, which, you know, dogs, of course, are, are uh, considered edible fare in other parts of the world, southern China in particular, uh, you know, will eat puppies and, and, and really not think twice about it. And But not only do we not eat our dogs, but we give them names, oftentimes human names. Uh, my husky's name is Josh, and, and I know some guys that are named Josh, too. Uh, I talk to him like he talks back to me, and, uh, you know, some people really take that to, to quite a bit of an extreme, so that I don't go, but uh, we, we treat our, our pets as members of the family often, and this is a sort of a sacred cow kind of thing. No, nothing rational about it, but but uh, nonetheless, we separate them out, and, and, you know, we give them special privilege, and, and we give them special considerations and things like that. And so individuals in southern China may look at how we deal with, and, and in fact do, uh, look at how we deal with our pets and, and you know, will shake their heads and, you know, not, not really understand um, any of that. You know, there's something that's so commonplace to us. Richard Edgerton wrote about... Um, cultures that he referred to as sick cultures and he said that there are some practices in cultures around the world and in particular he uh, he writes about a practice such as female genital mutilation which is a, a practice in in um, I was just going to say more primitive societies again that's sort of an ethnocentric way of describing it but let's say less uh, culturally advanced societies you know more traditional societies uh, uh, where um, uh, control of women remains a very important part in that culture and um, and an accepted practice in that culture and um, things are done to the uh, genitalia of women in order to protect them uh, from sexual activity um, and to ensure that they're available for their husbands someday um, and, and um, in our in our world in the United States, in fact, uh, we we find this to be very repugnant and repulsive. And, and and Edgerton says, regardless of cultural relativism, there are some things in the world that are just so uh, heinous that he believes we should not give them um, 
uh, an endorsement by saying, well, that's relative to that culture, that's understandable. And so that's an example of something like that. And the issue of uh, female genital mutilation does come up uh, in the United States from time to time with individuals who have moved here from other cultures. And you might, if you're interested in that, you might want to read a little more about that. It's a really uh, uh, kind of a very intriguing topic. Some people would refer, uh, would, would consider uh, male circumcision. You know, our tradition in the United States has been at least that uh, our, our male babies, the foreskin is removed from their penis uh, right around the time of birth. And um, many believe that to be in a very anachronistic and barbaric tradition um, that, that uh, really begins the male's uh, life with, uh, uh, you know, a, a sort of a trauma to their, to their genitals. And, um, and again, is based upon some old beliefs and some religious practices in some respects. Um, but uh, roughly, I think I read one time, 80 to 85 percent of the males around the world are not circumcised. And yet, you know, that's probably, I don't think it's as high of a percentage in the United States any longer because circumcision isn't being practiced as commonly, as routinely as it once was, but it's still, I believe, quite the norm in the United States. So again, in other cultures, this might be considered, uh, you know, a, a sick behavior as well. And so we have to judge cultures. Well, I guess how we see cultures really depends upon how we judge them. And um, how, there, here's a man shown showering in the street in India because none of the homes in his village have running water. And so from an ethnocentric standpoint, we might see this as very primitive, um, kind of, uh, again, you know, barbarian in nature and uh, reflective, of, you know, unsanitary, perhaps he's standing in dirt and, that kind of thing. Uh, whereas uh, from his own culture, this is very understandable as a common practice and is considered clean. And so this is a good example of, of how a behavior might be judged differently depending upon the lens that you're using to view it. So symbolic culture has uh, five different components and the and these components are symbols, gestures, language, norms, and values. Symbols of a culture in America are, are pretty much all around us. You know, and the first one that comes to mind, of course, is the American flag. And to see this, uh, it, it, and the interesting thing is, again, something that I've learned, well, my German students in particular, the German exchange students that I've had, um, they're, they're very concerned about nationalism in that country. And um, my, my German students have said that the flag waving that goes on in the United States is really considered uh, in Germany would be considered a very negative thing, even during things like, uh, you know, the World Soccer Cup and things like that. The, the, the expressions of nationalism uh, as, as people support their country is, is, is uh, considered to be somewhat uh, of a mixed blessing. And that goes back to the fact that uh, in their history, their recent history, uh, hit you know Hitler kind of fanned the flames of nationalism there to uh, lead the nation kind of over the precipice you know in the years leading up to World War II and so um, the things that the young people are being taught in that nation now really are to you know not get caught up in that kind of thing again and they're, and they're taught about the reasons that the negative aspects of that nationalism and yet things like the American flag and patriotism in America, you know, our leaders have been strong on that and have, have um, really whooped it up around those issues. And, and uh, in other parts of the world, that would not be considered a positive necessarily. But that's, a, that's an example of symbolic culture. Uh, gestures, you know, are, are both within larger cultures and in, and in um, um, subcultures and Countercultures have have meaning sometimes, which can also be very powerful. Uh, in a church, for instance, you know the sign of the cross is 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 considered a sacred movement. Let's say in the Catholic Church, you know, a sacred gesture or whatever. Um, gangs have certain gestures, certain ways they wear their clothing, for instance, that communicate one thing or another to each other. And in fact, some gestures in the United States um, that are considered profane and I won't necessarily name them, uh, are not considered profane in other cultures and have different meanings. And so from culture to culture, gestures, um, they're not universal. And, and uh, by and large, I mean, not all cult gestures are universal. And so it has a different meaning from culture to culture. Uh, one of the people, one person said one time that a smile is a universal gesture. 
um, and that, that that has the same meaning throughout the world. And perhaps that is true, um, but but uh, many cultures, uh, or rather many gestures, have different meanings from culture to culture. And you really need to be careful about that when you go overseas, because you you um, you know you might be considered very rude. We're going to touch on language a little more here, uh, but language is another part, another component of culture that is very, very important. Um, I I learned a little bit about about I, I was able to connect the importance of language was one of the things that was going on in my life because. Uh, um, with my exchange students, one of the things the exchange program emphasized was um, not having them talk with their their families um, too frequently. Uh, that that really there was an encouragement of them keeping the number of times that they talk with their with their families and friends back home to uh, a, a really a minimum uh, during their placement here. And one of the reasons was that it said that it, it intruded in their learning of the English language and intruded in the immersion in their own culture. And and um, this made really sense to me as I learned a little bit more about the importance of language because in order to understand a culture, this is one of the basic components of the culture, you have to get the language. And, and uh, the exchange uh, program's concerns were that uh, as students talk to people back home and would use their native language that would really set back the development of their own um, uh, incorporation of the English language and uh, you know all of that. So, so anyway, the, if, if this was to be a cultural exchange, the, the, the exchange organization understood how key language was to that exchange and growth. Norms and values, again, we're going to talk about more in the second part of the lecture, so I'll move past that now, but these uh, are related to beliefs um, and, and uh, behaviors. So what, talk, let's look at language for a moment. What are the kinds of things that language does? Well, it's very important and key to a culture because it allows human experience to be cumulative. You remember I was saying that, that one of the definitions of culture, one of the, the key components of that is, is that all of these, the language, customs, beliefs, values, are passed from one generation to the next. That enables the culture to survive uh, its members. That enables the culture to continue to live on and to grow older and older and older and more ingrained. This is one of the reasons why, as we've talked about some of the uh, beliefs and values, or we will talk about beliefs and values later in the semester, uh, about such things as gender and race and age and and um, and uh, in economics and those kinds of things that that uh, that I will say that while we make we we are making advances intellectually let's say in this day and age um, there are still things that are ingrained within us that support the old ways and the old beliefs gender inequalities racial inequalities uh, discrimination and prejudices and those kinds of things and, and and that is because I believe that really the culture um, we we don't just like change a culture in a, in a in a generation or in a in a year or by attending a conference and having our consciousness raised our consciousness may raise but the fabric of our individualism the fabric of uh, well really not of our individualism the fabric of our group our shared group experience as a member of a culture doesn't change that easily and so it's still there and it's something that those of us who wish to change certain elements of our lives or our belief system really have to remind ourselves and work at changing and so language is the way that our experience is passed from one generation to the next language also prepare so then providing us a, a social or a shared past and a shared or social future uh, language takes us out of the here and now and and uh, allows us to connect to things that have come before us and allows us to anticipate things that will come together or come come in the future and that will allow us to plan together uh, so that we can have an impact upon the future without language our existence really would be here and now so we can have uh, shared perspectives and and we can develop uh, rather complex goal-directed behaviors by communicating through language with each other. There is a, an article or two in, in the book about uh, language and um, isolation and how the, the language skill is, is uh, hampered by not interacting with other human beings and that kind of thing if you're interested in the uh, reader that is the, the, uh, the Kingsley Davis article refers to that. So just a little bit about the importance of language, and, and this is an interesting thing, you know, when you talk about labels, 
our name is a label and and uh, um, here's a good example of how we associate certain labels certain names certain words with certain components and here race or ethnicity being the component the difference in uh, how you view the name Travis Terrell and Tomas and what what culture uh, what race or ethnicity you connect with this I think it's fairly clear that uh, these kinds of things have certain associations that in our heads connect us to a certain race or ethnicity so words names very 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 powerful things in our in our consciousness and, and so it, it kind of leads us to this question about uh, if, if language is so central to a culture um, does it make sense that that uh, elements of American culture believe that uh, all individuals coming to America should learn English and practice English as their primary language? And there are places in Miami as an example of that where uh, about half of the residents speak Spanish and and uh, many of them that's their native language. You know that is the language with which they were raised. And so, should immigrants coming to the United States be required to learn English or if they come through Miami should they be learned to require Spanish since you know that is a, a dominant uh, language there should uh, Americans living in the United States in, in uh, southern United States for instance be required to learn Spanish the the um, the fact is is that in many many of the larger cities if you've traveled into the south you know uh, Texas California Florida oftentimes uh, we have a, a it's almost a bilingual environment in that uh, oftentimes like for instance you know announcements in the airports are made in both English and Spanish sometimes in some of the cities and so um, should we require immigrants to to learn English should it be required by the government um, in order to blend into the culture to become a part of the mainstream culture to be successful economically it appears as though a command of the English language is necessary just by the way the business world functions here um, however consider also that as you do that uh, we are um, uh, you know, we're really watering down their own, the individual's own cultures and uh, their ability to access that culture and the experience of, of that culture. There's a hypothesis called the superior wharf hypothesis that says that uh, instead of objects determining our language, our language determines the way we see objects. In other words, this says language defines our reality and an object um, doesn't exist first and we give it a word but rather if we don't have a word an object may not exist uh, a, uh, a certain uh, a certain thing may not exist or um, an object may be seen much more uh, in depth and much more thoroughly and much more uh, complexly that's not a word than than if if we didn't have uh, that word now let me give an example of this Eskimos and and this is a kind of a well-known thing uh, that there are I, I don't know the number let's say 126 different uh, words that Eskimo the Eskimo uh, ethnic group use to describe snow and forgive me to, for the native Alaskans I know the Eskimo is is a term that is used as a sort of a generic kind of term referring to native Alaskans and and um, the text here kind of falls into that but uh, nonetheless you get the, the point here that about uh, that native Alaskans you know, have many many different words for snow and really one of the things that tells you is the significance of this uh, of this uh, uh, event snow um, to to the lives of of individuals in in uh, particularly in Bush Alaska now and in in uh, the, the um, development the, the more industrialized or develop, uh, developed areas on the road system let's say snow is still a, a very major uh, major factor in our lives but not uh, the same as it is to those living in villages off the road system where transportation may change from uh, boat to um, snow machine or even skis or some snowshoes or something like that and and um, some snow is crusty, some snow is fluffy, some snow will support weight and others won't, you know. Um, and so there are many, many different definitions of snow. Um, and, and that really kind of talks about the importance of that in the reality of, of the Alaskan culture. Another example 
and uh, this is something I add to this. My Finnish exchange student, uh, when he came, was very proud of the fact that uh, um, that his oops that his country had a um, female president. And while there are other nations around the world that have female leaders, Finland was one of the first, and and. Um, uh, really was you know like I said he was quite proud of this and one thing I, I noticed as we went through the the year was is that um, he had a tendency sometimes to get his he and she mixed up and he would refer to um, a woman as a he and refer to a man as a she and we talked about that some and, and uh, he explained to me that in the Finnish language they really don't have gendered pronouns that everything is more or less like an it in, in Finland and it just causes me to wonder um, you know, if this is the case, perhaps um, gender not being that important in their language, perhaps gender in their minds is less important as well, less a distinction. And so in that respect, it would not be surprising that they would have a female national leader before many other nations in the world would have that. Just an interesting thing there about language again. Another way of looking at this is, you know, labels and how might we think of this woman differently, just the power of words depending upon how we label her. Is, is she a cancer survivor? Then you think you see her as being an, a person with an illness and you know perhaps a sh uh, you know a questionable future. Um, does she make an alternative fashion statement by by cutting her hair and and um, then of course you see her very differently as a sort of a defiant and gender busting kind of individual who might be you know ahead of her time a competitive swimmer she's an athlete and she's just trying to cut down the, the her resistance her body's resistance to movement and so you can see there again uh, labels words uh, create reality create what we see and inform what we see likewise with language and race and uh, racial terms have different meanings and and um, while we often refer to uh, President Obama as, as a the first black president, the first African-American president, uh, we may forget that um, his mother was Caucasian. And so he's as much Caucasian as he is African-American. And so is he multiracial? Is he white? Is he black? And and the meaning of that is very different. You know, the meaning that the, the meaning of him being in the White House is very different depending upon how you how you view him and how you view his his racial heritage. And so um, and we'll talk more about this as as uh, when we talk about the uh, or we we um, go through the section on race and ethnicity in a few weeks. So that will end uh, the first part of this week's lecture. So come back and listen to the second part when you have an opportunity and we'll talk about norms and values. Thank you.